K-theory of a ring is defined by a group completion. It is the group completion of the monoid of isomorphism classes of finitely generated projective modules. Now it's important that we do not allow infinitely generated modules in the definition. If we did, we would be working in a world with infinite sums. In a world with infinite sums, the unexpected is bound to happen. In the stories, it might go something like this. A knight and a dragon meet. The knight cries, O oh, mighty serpent, give me your treasure. The dragon rumbles, Be gone, thou churlish knave, I am in no mood for thievery. Nothing shall you have. Nothing? Very well. If I take this coin, and at the same time, put it back, then I have taken nothing. Do you not agree? Will you allow this? Hmm, yes. So the knight took nothing, a whole lot of nothing. In the land with infinite sums, nothing becomes something via a simple maneuver. In an infinite sum of take and put back, the knight simply shifts the groupings and leaves a take at the very end. From one side it is a miracle, something from nothing, trickery. From the other it is a swindle, something becomes nothing, thievery. Of course, in our usual arithmetic there are no infinite sums. And indeed, one is not equal to zero. An algebraic manifestation of this phenomenon is known as Eilenberg's swindle. The knight's shifting technique works in the presence of infinite sums. A projective R module becomes free after adding on an infinite rank free module. This implies that the class of the projective module P is actually zero in the group completion of the monoid of isomorphism classes of all projective R modules. This means that if you define K-theory using all projective modules, you get zero. The moral of the story is that it is essential to allow only finitely generated projective modules in the definition of K-theory. Now any good swindle contains a grain of truth. Let M be a finitely generated R module such that R plus M is isomorphic to R. We saw that the infinite rank free R module R infinity satisfies this isomorphism. That was the swindle. But now we only allow for M to be finitely generated. Rings with this property are called flask. This is a special property. No such module exists for most rings. This is good because flask rings have vanishing K-theory, essentially for the same reason as in the swindle. We explained the vanishing of K0, but this vanishing holds for all the K groups. As mentioned, this is a special property. If R is commutative, then there is a surjection from R to a field. We know that over fields, K0 is Z, generated by rank. This forces R to have non-zero K-theory. A flask ring is thus necessarily non-commutative. One example of a flask ring is the cone ring of a ring R. 
The cone ring, written C of R, consists of certain infinite matrices. It consists of those matrices which have finitely many non-zero entries in each row and each column. Any finite matrix can be considered as an element in the cone ring. But we also allow things like the infinite identity matrix, which has infinitely many non-zero rows and infinitely many non-zero columns. The important thing is, is that in each particular row or column, we have only finitely many non-zero entries. This condition lets us define matrix multiplication with the usual formula, and the cone ring is indeed a ring. It isn't hard to see that the cone ring is flask, but what can we do with it? We'd like to say that the cone ring of R contains R, and so we obtain an embedding of R into a ring whose k-theory vanishes. This would be useful for reasons we'll come to. Actually, there are lots of ways you can stick R into C of R, but none of these are a two-sided ideal, and that's not so good for us. But we can instead consider the ring M of R consisting of matrices with only finitely many non-zero entries. This is the union of the n by n matrices for all n. This ring is embedded in the cone as a two-sided ideal. Now something called Morita invariance tells us that the k-theory of R is the same as the k-theory of finite matrices over R. So, for k-theory purposes, there is no distinction between R and M of R. Great! Finally, we consider the suspension ring, which is the quotient of the cone by this two-sided ideal. This situation reminds us of the construction of the suspension of a topological space. And indeed, since the cone has no k-theory, we can see that the suspension just shifts the degree of the k-groups. But the k-groups have only been defined for natural numbers. And so in fact, this lets us define k-theory in negative degrees. We extend the k-groups to negative degrees using iterations of the suspension ring. So for example, k minus 1 of a ring is defined to be k0 of its suspension ring. This method of using the cone ring to define negative k-theory is due to Kurobi and Villamayor. There are various other ways of defining the negative k-groups, each with its own particular advantage. Of course, at the end of the day, all methods produce the same values for negative k-theory. It is not at all obvious from the way we have defined it, but it turns out that the negative k-groups vanish whenever R is smooth. That is, when R is the coordinate ring of a smooth variety, such as an elliptic curve. Well, Can the negative k-groups be non-zero? Sure. If R is the coordinate ring of a variety with singularities, then negative k-groups can be non-zero. For example, this singular surface has a non-vanishing k-1. But there is a limit to how many of these k-groups can be non-zero. For normal surfaces, Weibel computed that the only negative k-groups, which can be non-zero, are k-1 and k-2. This was a special case of an important conjecture about negative k-groups. The conjecture due to Weibel was that once you drop below the negative of the dimension of the ring, then your negative k-theory is actually zero. Progress on this conjecture, proving special cases, was made slowly over several decades. The conjecture was finally resolved in 2018 using methods from derived algebraic geometry by Kurt Strunk-Tama. But this is a story for another day.